So let's talk about the opium wars first. Prior to the 1830s, uh, China had been very uh, isolationist and very exclu exclusionary in their trade agreements. In fact, up until about 1830, there was only one port in China. It was the port of Canton that uh, was allowed to be used by foreign traders. And the traders were not allowed to leave the port. They were not allowed to learn Japanese. And the Chinese were not interested in trading for anything. They would simply sell their goods for silver. Uh, so it was all a pure hard currency economy in terms of uh, the Chinese. Well, this created real problems for some of the traders, most specifically for the British. The British had a real appetite for a lot of the things that China had to offer, particularly some of the silks and ceramics, but most especially the tea. By the end of the 17th century, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 18th century, 1799-1800, the British were importing six tons of Chinese tea a year. Uh, tea doesn't weigh very much by comparison to a lot of things, and so that was a lot of tea, and there was a, a continually increasing appetite for tea. Well, the, the British had a real problem. Not only were they not allowed to trade anything, because the Chinese didn't want anything uh, that they had, but they had to come up with silver. There are no silver mines in Britain. And so they literally had to go to Mexico and buy Mexican silver dollars, the British did, in order to use those as hard currency to purchase the things they wanted, most especially tea, from the Chinese. And this trade imbalance was beginning to be a real hardship on the British, and they were constantly struggling with how do we break through this barrier, be able to get more of the things that we really want, especially tea, without it being such a hard currency drain on us. Well. Um, Finally, they came up with uh, a solution. The uh, British East India Company came up with a solution to this problem. They had been importing small quantities legally of opium that was grown in India. And of course, India was under the control and authority of Britain. The small amount that was imported was for legal use in Chinese medicine, but it was tightly controlled because opium import, apart from that small quantity, was illegal in China. Well, the British East India Company started talking to some of the Chinese merchants in Canton and discovered whether it was legal or not, they were very interested in getting more opium because there was a very high cash markup for it um, in China. So the British East India Company, the British um, government, started importing larger and then larger and then larger quantities of opium, which they would sell illegally to traders in Canton who would then make a huge profit on it. Well, the problem with that is not only was it illegal, but it ended up creating a huge problem in China. In fact, by the um, 1839, estimates were that along the East Coast, which is obviously where the trading was taking place from Canton and other ports, along the East Coast of China, as much as 90% of young men became addicted to smoking opium. It was a huge problem. They suffered from, uh, from reduction of the workforce because people were too stoned to go to work. Uh, the military was suffering from this. And finally, the emperor said, if this continues, we're neither going to have enough soldiers to, put, to replace our, our army, nor are we going to have any money to support the army. And the reason for that was, instead of it being a, a large hard currency income, to trade with the British because the British were giving silver, all of a sudden the um, silver was going out because the trade deficit had reversed. The value of the opium was so much. In fact, in one year, there was a hundred, uh, well, well, there was two and a half times, uh, I was going to give you teals and that doesn't mean anything to you. There were two and a half times the annual budget of the Qing Chinese government was going out of the country in terms of the value of opium. That, and it was all illegal. And so after a period of time, they decided, the emperor said, we have got to do something about this. We have got to stop this. Uh, we got to put our foot down. At that point, he hired or appointed a new governor for Canton, Governor Lin Zhezhu. And he was a hardcore nationalist, a loyal servant of the emperor, and was absolutely determined that he was going to end the corruption. And Canton, at the same time, had become 
a center for vice and corruption and really anti-emperor disloyalty because the emperor was saying this is illegal we can't keep doing this and the people were making fortunes on it so they didn't want to listen to the emperor so canton had become a problem so the, the emperor appoints governor lin zezu zechu excuse me um, and as the new governor of canton and he immediately starts to take action right away he arrests 1600 people both chinese and british he confiscates in the first few months of being on the job 20,000 uh, chests of opium and each of those chests weighed 150 pounds so 20,000 150 pound chests of opium were confiscated he had and that's what this represents up here uh, he had trenches dug, put the chests of opium in the trenches, covered them with lime, and then had the whole thing soaked with seawater, which effectively destroyed the opium. It was estimated this was 9 million pounds worth of opium, pound being the British monetary unit, of course. Well, the British are going crazy about this, and they're, you know, they're appealing to their home government, saying you've got to do something about this, even though all of this was plainly illegal by Chinese uh, law. To make matters worse, in July of 1839, the same year that um, Zhe Chu was appointed, there was an incident where a group of American and British uh, sailors off of one of the opium clippers, again, they, these were smuggling ships, they rioted in, um, in Hong Kong, which was still part of China at that point, they killed a Chinese man, they vandalized a Buddhist temple, and then went back to their ship. Well, when the Chinese government demanded that they be turned over to them for trial and punishment, the British refused and said, um, no, they, we'll, we'll take care of this. And the Chinese passed a law right away that said that anybody to be allowed to trade in China, you had to sign an agreement that you would abide by all Chinese laws. Well, the British didn't like that either because they felt like this was going to be controlling to them. So at this point, um, the, the British decide we need to do something about it. They had a British trade commissioner who uh, shut down some of the ports by, by using gunships. This is, this is where we get into the beginning of gunship diplomacy, the same thing that happened in Japan if you were in those lectures. So in august of 1839 the british decide that they are going to take military action in order to try to change the policy of the chinese government with regard to how many ports they could trade in whether or not their uh, their people were subject to chinese law and whether or not they would be able to continue to trade in opium and part of the thing was that since they could get the opium cheap from india that more than offset the cost of the tea and so as long as the British were going to keep drinking tea, they needed to come up with some way to, to uh, offset that. So in 1839 to 1842, we have the first Opium War in which the, the British military went to war against Qing China in order to force them to make concessions to allow opium to be sold in the country. Now remember, the reason, one big reason the Chinese had said they wouldn't allow it was because 90% of the young males on the whole East Coast, the most populated area of China, were considered to be addicted to smoking opium. So this was a problem. I want to read you a quote, if I can get enough light here. This is from a British citizen named Thomas Arnold, and it gives one perspective that people um, on, on that side of it had. He said, this war with China really seems to be so wicked as to be a national sin of the greatest possible magnitude, and it distresses me very deeply. Cannot anything be done by petition or otherwise to awaken men's minds to the dreadful guilt we are incurring? I really do not remember in any history of a war undertaken with such combined injustice and baseness. Ordinary wars of conquest are to me far less wicked than to go to war in order to maintain smuggling, and that smuggling consisting in the introduction of a demoralizing drug which the government of China wishes to keep out and which we, for our lucre of gain, want to introduce by force, and in this quarrel are going to burn and slay in the pride of our supposed superiority." That was a British citizen writing about his view of this war. So for two and a half years, the British government fought against the Qing 
Chinese imperial military in order to force them to accept opium. Particularly, you'll notice this ship over here, which was a uh, steam-powered side-wheeler, the Nemesis, um, the, the very best of the Chinese junk warships had no chance against the iron-sided British ships at this point. Um, they just devastated them. The Nemesis, particularly in the mouth of the Pearl River, which is the river by Hong Kong, um, was completely controlling all of that. So despite all of their efforts, the British took control of Hong Kong, they took control of the Pearl River, which comes up from Hong Kong, and one by one, they continue to control various ports along the coast. This is, an, uh, this is Hong Kong down here, where we started, and you'll see these yellow, these uh, green lines that come up. Various ports along the way, they would go in and using their gunships, they would take control. They would destroy some of the coastal forts. They would destroy um, junk military, that junk meaning that's the kind of ship, military ships in the various ports up to um, Tianjin, which we're going to be at, and Beijing. After two and a half years, of the British, and they landed troops on, on shore as well, and they were successful in all of their land battles. So whether it be the bombardments from the sea that were destroying uh, Chinese coastal ports, the land battles, because the Chinese are still using uh, bows and arrows, or they were using a, um, a firelock, they uh, basically very ancient guns, whereas the British were using, at that point, very modern muskets and other kind of weaponry, and plus the cannons that they had on their ships. So the, Jap the uh, Chinese stood no chance. In this two and a half year war, 69 total British military were killed, 18,000 Chinese were killed. So you get some idea that the complete inequity of all of that. Well, it was so bad that finally, the Chinese sued for peace, and they ended up signing a treaty called the Treaty of Nanjing. And it's the first of what were called the unequal treaties for China. Uh, Japan suffered from this a little bit as well early on. The unequal treaties were ones in which China was forced to make concessions that were in, not in their best interest because of the military power, the significantly greater military power of the Western powers. And they were Un unequal treaties with Britain, with America, with France, with Russia, all of them taking advantage of their military superiority to force China to make concessions that were not in their own interest. Uh, this treaty was signed on August 29th of 1842, and among the concessions they were forced to make is they gave Hong Kong to the British. This is why it was only a few years ago that Hong Kong was given back to China because the British were given control of Hong Kong as one of the, the payments they had to make for losing the war, um, so that Hong Kong had belonged to the British up until fairly recently. They also had to open, increase the number of ports that the British were allowed to use to five rather than one. Um, they had to guarantee the British, any British citizens or anybody who came as part of a British mission, like if it were an American working on a British ship, for example, they were guaranteed extra nationality. What that meant was they were not subject to the laws of China. They were only subject to their own laws, and China could not arrest or prosecute anyone for any crimes. This is a major blow to any country's sovereignty. You no longer have control of, of the people in your, that are in your country. You know, your laws no longer apply, and that was considered a major blow. Uh, Britain also demanded that they be given most favored nation status. What that meant was that any other concessions that China made to any country automatically also was given to Britain. So that they, they got the benefit of any other kind of agreements. Um, plus, the Chinese were forced to pay 21 million, the equivalent of $21 million in silver reparations. So they had to pay for the cost of this war that was fought in order to prevent um, opium from coming into their country. This created an enormous hardship economically for the Chinese. It really significantly affected their prestige amongst other countries, their, their, the sense of sovereignty, the ability to run their own affairs, and people were noticing this. Uh, particularly Japan was noticing this. And you will remember that later on they fought two wars against, uh, against China, and the point at which they started thinking that China could be a target for, for our Japanese imperialistic aggressions probably was right here. 
uh, the Russians as well were looking at this. So uh, this was a, a major blow to Chinese um, self-pride and sovereignty and, and everything else. Well, the, you can imagine that the Chinese were not real quick to try to meet all of these obligations that had been forced on them in the Treaty of Nanjing from the first Opium War. So what happened was, as they were dragging their feet, Britain decided they were going to twist the screws a little tighter. In 1854, the British come back and they demand other concessions. They say that all ports in China must be open to them. They insist that uh, they don't have to pay any tariffs. Their tariffs were set at like 4% before. Now they didn't want to have to pay any tariffs. They wanted to have a permanent ambassador with authority in Beijing, and they wanted legalization of the British opium trade. They wanted it to be legal for them to import as much opium as they could. So um, on October 8th of 1856, another event sort of sparked the violence, and that was there was a ship called the Arrow. The Second Opium War is sometimes called the Arrow Incident because there was a ship in Hong Kong called the Arrow. It was a British ship, but it had some Chinese sailors on it. Well, the Chinese officials went on board the Arrow and they arrested 12 Chinese who were on board and accused them of smuggling and piracy. The British demanded that those soldiers, those uh, Chinese sailors, be returned to the British because they claimed they were eligible for extra nationality because they were aboard a British ship and that the Chinese should never have come on board. Well, they ended up um, arguing about this. Eventually, they were released by the Chinese, but the British still decided they needed to take action to show that they were insulted by this. So their ships bombarded 20 and destroyed 20 coastal forts of China, and they sunk um, 12 of the larger ships in the Chinese Navy, just to say, this is what happens when you do something we don't like. At the same time that this was going on, they invited other Western countries, including America, although America didn't participate, or Russia didn't participate, but the French decided that they would participate. They were angry because the Chinese had arrested and executed a French missionary named Auguste Chapel de um, not long before this because he had left the port where he was supposed to be limited. He was trying to spread Christianity in areas he wasn't supposed to be in. And at this point, China was involved in a major, fighting a major rebellion called the Taiping Rebellion. The Taiping Rebellion very, came very close to taking down the Qing uh, dynasty. And it was um, a sort of a cultic Christian movement. There was uh, a the man who led it had tried and failed several times to pass the uh, the examination in order to become a, an imperial uh, bureaucrat because they had Confucian tests for that. After, after failing many times, he had kind of a religious awakening. He had received some Christian brochures and he came to believe that he was God's prophet who was supposed to straighten out China and also that he was the younger brother of Jesus. And he and had a group of followers and because they were wanting to fight back against the emperor and the Qing emperor was not very popular because they were not um, Han, they were not ethnically Han Chinese. The last empire, the Qing empire, uh, was from Manchuria. They were Manchus. And so he generated an army and launched a rebellion called the Taiping Rebellion, which was loosely affiliated with Christianity. Well, this um, French missionary was accused not only of spreading Christianity was where he wasn't supposed to, but also of cooperating with and perhaps participating with the leaders of the Taiping Rebellion. And so he was arrested, was uh, found guilty, and was to be executed. The guards in his jail beat him to death before he could be executed by, by decapitation. But the French were mad about that. So the French said, we're going to join with the British in this war. We're going to participate in it. So both the British and the French um, launched an effort, and by the way, another thing that the British wanted is they wanted the, the Chinese to greatly increase the number of indentured servants that they gave to Britain, what were called coolies in those days. They are non-skilled labor. Indentured servant is a fancy word for slave, basically. Somebody you pay a fee for, but you don't have to pay them. All you have to do is feed them. And so they wanted more of these 
uh, indentured servants, these coolies from China. That was another particular thing they asked for. So the second opium war was between Britain and France on one side and the Chinese on the other. Um, in this war, the, the Chinese got a little bit the better of it. There were 2,900 foreigners killed in the second war and up to 30,000 Chinese nationals were killed in this war. Um, they eventually had to sign, the Chinese had to sign another treaty called the, the Tianjin Treaty, which was very punitive. They signed it in June of 1858. It, it forced the opening of even more ports to the British. It uh, gave any foreigner with a passport the right to travel anywhere they wanted, which had been limited before. It gave the right of Christian missionaries to share Christianity anywhere they wanted to. And the, the uh, Chinese Christians, previously when someone converted to Christianity in China, there was a reduction of their property rights. It reinstated <laughs> all of the rights for Chinese Christians. So um, there were a number of things. In addition, China had to pay reparations, again, back to France and back to Britain. And Russia, even though they had not really participated in the war, Russia stepped in and took the left bank of the Amur River in order to establish a port there, which is Vladivostok. The reason that the Russians have a seaport in Vladivostok is because at the end of the Second Opium War, they stepped in, along with the other allies, and just took that property away from China. Um, later on, they tried to take more property away so that they would have a warm water port down in a place that the next tour, the next uh, voyage is going to go to Dalian, Dalian used to be called Port Arthur, and it was a, that's where the, the uh, Russo-Japanese War happened, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, at this point, China is in a spiral downwards. They, uh, the Qing Dynasty has suffered greatly in terms of any, any prestige that they had. In fact, the Qing Dynasty would go away in 1911, and the Republic of China would come along. But in the interim, they would be defeated by, in, in 1894 and 5, they would be defeated by Japan, much to everyone's surprise. Japan defeated the what was still seen as the main power in Asia, and that was China, in the, Sino, the first Sino-Japanese War. So this is very important, and it led, eventually, uh, all of this negative stuff led to the, the next event I want to talk about, which is the Boxer Rebellion. There was a lot of photography from the Boxer Rebellion, so you can see a lot of images in this. By 1899, many of the Chinese were tired of the foreign influence. They had sort of carved up China, that, uh, so all of these Western nations had their own area of influence. Britain was in Hong Kong, the Germans had a section, etc. And so they... The Chinese were tired of this. They, they referred often to the foreign devils that had polluted their country and ruined their culture and taken their land away from them, that had taken away their prestige, their power, their recognition as being a major world um, scene. So, in 1899, in the Shandong uh, province, a group of young men, and it was especially uh, made worse because it was a two-year drought, and a lot of the young men, uh, there was no crops in the field, so they had nothing, no work to do. They formed a sort of martial arts society, the name of which was the Society of the Righteous and Harmonious Fist. And they were committed to uh, fighting back against all of this foreign influence that they think had been the downfall of China. And that led to the Boxer Rebellion. They were a martial arts society, I mentioned this once before, and so the Westerners, when they saw them practicing their martial arts, because they would, as a group, publicly go through various uh, movements in their martial arts, it looked like boxing to the Westerners. And so they called them boxers, and it became known as the Boxer Rebellion. Well, it was a violent, anti-Western, anti-colonial, anti-Christian uprising. Um, because they were practice, practicers of martial arts, the boxers came to believe that by breath control, by magical incantations, and by swallowing various kinds of magical charms, that they were, would be impervious to any Western weapons. They would, could not be shot, they could not be killed with a sword. They believed that they were an impervious army, and they ended up gathering a very large army uh, to do battle. 
their, their sort of battle cry was um, support the Qing government and exterminate the foreigners. Well, that put the Chinese government in something of a quandary. Here they had what amounted to a major uprising all over the country because it spread very quickly, and yet the uprising was supposed to be in favor of the government and against the foreigners that had been treating the Chinese uh, government very badly. The Dowager Empress at that point, who was really the one that was in charge, although her son was the emperor, the Dowager Empress uh, Sichi was, at first she was against this uprising and thought we should put it down, and then she very quickly decided maybe, maybe there are enough people behind this that we really can get these foreigners out of our country and not be under their control anymore. And so she finally ended up supporting the Boxer Rebellion. So it ended up being the civilian Boxer um, sort of militiamen, along with the Imperial Army, fighting against the civilian population at first, and then later on, um, other, other foreigners who would come in to try to defend. These images, this is a Boxer presenting himself with his spear and shield and a flag declaring his, his commitment. The people here are Chinese Christians. There had been a fairly large Chinese popul Christian population at that point, and you might be interested to know that some scholars believe that there probably are more Christians in China today than there are in the whole rest of the world because the Chinese underground Christian church is huge but it's underground and so we don't have exact numbers on that. Oh, While Christianity is technically legal it's still tightly controlled in many ways. The house churches have to be registered and that sort of thing. Um, here we have an example of Chinese Catholics who are preparing to defend their church against the boxers. The boxers made a special target of the Chinese Christians because um, they felt that the Chinese Christians were defying their Buddhist Confucian um, culture. It had been customary in the past, remember I just mentioned there was a two-year drought, it had been customary in the past under the Buddhist and Confucian ideas that whenever there was a drought or, or like other kinds of problems, everyone in communities would get together and they would pray to their ancestors and to the gods to relieve the drought. Well, in this two-year drought that had come along, the Chinese Christians would not do that. They don't pray to ancestors or other gods, and so they wouldn't participate, and the boxers believed that the Christians' unwillingness to pray to ancestors and the gods of Buddhism and, and, um, and Confucianism, their unwillingness to do that was one of the reasons why they continue to have problems, why the drought did not abate. And so they blamed them for that, and then other stories were created that Christians would slaughter, secretly slaughter Chinese and use their organs to make magical potions, that they were poisoning wells in various villages. All sorts of kind of stories were made up to justify the boxers' uh, persecution of the Christians. Many, we don't know exactly how many, perhaps as many as 30,000 Chinese Christians were killed during the Boxer Rebellion, and um, many, many tens of thousands more were displaced. They were forced, as these people were, to leave their homes, and so it was a very bad situation for them. Um, but we don't know exactly how many there were. In addition to the Buddhists and Confucians who were against the Westerners, the image here, you will remember this morning I talked about Zhang He being a Muslim, of a, a Muslim minority called the Hui in China. Well, the Hui Muslims in China also didn't like the Western influence, partly because of the Western uh, insistence on introducing opium. As Muslims, the use of an, uh, of an intoxicating drug was contrary to their faith, and so they also felt their faith to be threatened. So they put together, the Hui Muslim group, put together 10,000 person army and marched to Beijing to support the Boxer Rebellion against the foreigners. Um, th these, the one on the left here, these are images of some of those soldiers, they called themselves the Kansu Braves, and they ended up being almost like the Imperial Guard protecting the Dowager Empress and the Emperor during some of this time. <laughs> this on the right is an indigenous um, Chinese priest, uh, a Christian priest, interestingly. This is the Dowager Empress Sichi, who again at first opposed the Boxer Rebellion, then supported it, and then realized as they got along that this was going to be a bad situation for her and for everyone else. Um, eventually, the Boxer Rebellion, it was going very well for them at first, and then 
because it was foreigners that were being attacked, there was a decision by Western powers to join together in an alliance to go to send a 55,000 person army into China to suppress this rebellion. So there were eight nations in alliance, if you count, these are representatives from all of them, if you count there are nine of these because one of them is Chinese and the Chinese, or Chinese, is Indian and the Indians were a subset of the British uh, military. The British had some Australians, some Indians, but there were 21,000 Japanese, 13,000 Russians, 12,000 British Commonwealth soldiers, including Australia and India, uh, 3,500 from France, 3,500 from the US, and then lesser numbers from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Germany, and Italy. So all of these nations got together, and because one of the first victims of the Boxer Rebellion was a German missionary, um, well, he didn't actually get killed, but some of the priests that were working with him got killed, um, the, he, the German Missionary Society in China at that time had been very aggressive, and not only aggressive evangelistically, but also in political matters. They frequently would defend, especially Christian Chinese, in legal matters, and so they became one of the first targets. So Kaiser Wilhelm uh, commissioned this group, you know, their, their commitment of military to go out and help in this multinational battle. And when he sent them off, as they were getting on board the ship, he said to them, I want you to go and battle like Huns. This is where the expression, the Germans being called Huns in the First World War came from. And he said, from now on, I want any Chinese who sees a German to shake in fear. So uh, there was a lot of racism involved in that, a lot of racism involved in all of the, the, the countries that came in. But this is an image of them landing troops and horses. These are some of the Germans that are involved. And here you see some of the Imperial forces that were prepared to fight against all these guys. Now, the when they came in here, there was a problem because particularly the Germans and the Russians were heavily inclined to rape and loot and murder. So much so that the Americans and the Japanese ended up having to turn their weapons on the Germans and the Russians to stop them from raping and killing, which was a strange thing when you think about what happened between the Japanese and the Chinese not too long after this you know, when the, the, the rape of Nanking and all those other things. And yet the Japanese and the Americans were the one that tried to, to stop a lot of the violence from occurring. Um, the, as I say, the battle was going quite well up until this, these army, this army from eight different nations arise. And they, in fact, a group of Western diplomats and soldiers and Christian Chinese had been forced into uh, the legation quarter in Beijing, Beijing at, at the time, and that they were under siege for over two months. And they were running out of food and running out of water. Well, then this military landed in Tianjin and defeated the Boxer Army there and then marched up to Beijing, ended up in August of that year, relieving the siege of the legation quarter. And at that point, the foreign troops went on a rampage of looting in uh, Beijing. Actually, I think it was called Peking at that time. It's gone through a series of names, Peking, Beijing, and now Beijing. So it was Peking at that time. They um, looted, claiming that this was reparations, that they had a right to do this to pay for what was, you know, what they had lost. Um, they rounded up the anyone who was suspected even slightly of being a boxer, part of the Boxer Rebellion. This is a group of boxers waiting, you know, prisoners, waiting to be judged. This is an image of a Chinese judge judging some of those that were accused of being boxers, parts of the rebellion. Um, many of the boxers, when they were captured, they were summarily executed, which are the images you get down here. Interestingly, uh, the those that were executed were executed by beheading. And they discovered very quickly that the Japanese were especially good at that because they had been trained more in the use of the sword than anyone else. And so the Japanese ended up being the ones more than anyone else who did the, um, the executions of the boxers. But again, most of these were summary executions. Even though some went through trial, most did not. And we have no record of anyone accused of being a boxer and part of the Boxer Rebellion being acquitted from those charges. And if they were found guilty, the penalty was execution. Um, another quote for you, this is from the American general of the forces there. His name was 
uh, Adney Chaffee. He said, it is safe to suppose that where one real boxer has been killed, 50 harmless coolies or laborers on the farms, including not a few women and children, have been slain. A great many of the people who were killed were innocent, and yet they got pulled into this thing and ended up being executed uh, as well. The Empress Dowager uh, Sichi, although she had supported this uh, Boxer Rebellion, she agreed to the peace agreement, which was called the Boxer Protocols, and the Boxer Protocols called for the top 10 Chinese government officials who, was, who were believed to have anything to do with this, that they were to be executed, and that China would be forced to pay 450 million taels of silver. That's the equivalent of 600 million ounces of silver. In today's exchange rate, that would be the equivalent of $11 billion that they had to pay back to these eight countries over 39 years. It was really crippling to them. Um, and yet, they didn't have a whole lot of choice. There were eight Western powers forcing this on them at that point. Here you have an uh, illustration of a Chinese executioner getting rid of one of the boxers. Now again, up to 30,000 Chinese Christians were killed, although we don't have an exact number. 20,000 imperial troops were killed. At least 20,000 civilians died in the process. We know the only number we have exactly is the number of foreign troops. 526 foreign troops died in the response to the Boxer Rebellion. Hundreds of uh, foreign missionary men, women, and children. We don't have a better number than that, but at least hundreds were killed throughout this process. So uh, it was a horrendously bloody event to put all of this down. And then at the end of it, here's a cartoon. This, of course, is China. We have um, Queen Victoria here representing Britain. This is Germany, Russia, uh, France, and Japan, all of them looking at China saying, how can we divide this up? And truly they did. They ended up with areas of control, what they call spheres of influence, which is a very polite way to say we've taken this away from you, um, and that they controlled after this period of time. And so the Boxer Rebellion actually made it worse for China. And it wasn't too long after this, this, this ended, you know, this is 1899-1902. Um, uh, by 1911, the Qing Empire had been deposed and the Republic of China was declared in 1912. Okay. Questions about any of that? Wasn't too bad, 40 minutes. Questions? Martin, did I answer your questions about the Boxer Rebellion? Okay. Yes. Um, did the New Republic continue with the reparations? No, I don't believe they did. They considered that an obligation that the Qing Empire, the dynasty, the Qing dynasty, had um, been obligated to. And so when the New Republic was declared, and then very shortly after that, of course, we have the, the, the Civil War begins between the nationalists of China, the Kuomintang, uh, and the communists, and then both of them end up fighting against the Japanese. Things got very hairy very quickly after this in terms of that part of the world. And so those reparations, I don't, I don't know that for a fact, but I don't think they were because I, I haven't read anything about that in any of the other materials that I know. Other questions? Uh, here first and then here. Yes. Uh, what happened to the alliances between like, the end of the Boxer Rebellion and 1911? Did they go away? Yeah, what happened between this period of time and, and 1911, of course, the, the First World War happens not too long after this. I actually have a lecture I do on the First World War when we were in Europe uh, touring, and the sort of horrendous domino effect that they had. Um, nothing that they did here had a positive impact in terms of their relationships later, but you have to realize that um, some of the major parties in the First World War were related. I mean, the Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm and Tsar Nicholas were first cousins. And in fact, Kaiser Wilhelm once said, if our grandmother, Queen Victoria, were still alive, she would never have allowed this. Um, so they had relationships before, but this idea that they had, they had treaty commitments to other countries. Now, I mentioned before that Russia's relationship with France was enhanced by the, uh, the Russo Japanese war because Germany and Japan were linked together and France was the enemy of Germany and so the Russians felt akin to France and signed a, a treaty agreement with them so that when the French 
and the Russian, you know, France and Russia followed each other into the First World War, and it was just one treaty after another being being called up, and that's what led to all that. But no, none of the relationships they had here was any benefit a few years later when the First World War came along. Um, in fact, some of the things I mentioned that the Russians took over the left bank of the Amur River and established Vladivostok. They also, in the Boxer Rebellion, because they had sent troops, the Russians had sent troops down into Russia, they left them in Manchuria. And in fact, they had promised to withdraw them afterwards, but instead, because they're right next door, see everybody else had to come by ship, the Russians are right there. The troops they sent into Manchuria, they promised they would withdraw, but instead, because they had designs on Manchuria, they increased over time the number of troops they had there, which is one of the problems that Japan had with them, is they saw the Russians taking over area that they had designs on. Okay, you had a question? Yeah, it seems Soviet caused all this problem, but it all came from India. And didn't you have an opium problem itself? And did any of these nations ever apologize to China for what they did? So, two questions. One, since India was the source of all the opium, did India have a problem? The answer to that is no, because the, the British had very tight control on, on India. The British were taking the opium and shipping it out, but it was not being used in India to any extent at all. Because the, it's interesting that during the same time that China was having the Taiping Rebellion, the British had the Sepoy Revolt um, in in. India, and in fact, one of the reasons they ended up having significant soldiers there is they had sent soldiers to India in larger numbers in order to put down the Sepoy Revolt, which was very interesting. A lot of the nationals who worked for the British, who were in the British military, were either Hindu or they were Muslim, and they were part of the British Army. Well, they introduced a new cartridge that went along with a new rifle the British had, and it, it came. the cartridge came in a paper wrapper. And the way you did it was you bit off the bullet part, you poured the gunpowder in, stuck the paper in as wadding, and then you spit the bear, you know, spit it in and then rammed it down. Well, they used fat to grease those cartridges to keep them from getting wet. And it turns out it was a it was a kind of oil that was not it wasn't animal fat. But the word got out to the Hindus that this was beef tallow, and it got out to the Muslims that this was pork tallow. And so the Sepoy Rebellion was primarily both the Muslims and the Hindus believed that their religion was not being was not being appropriately regarded in this new uh, cartridge they were being forced to use. And when they said we're not going to use them, the British arrested all those people said we weren't going to use them, and that's what caused the revolt. Okay, rather than simply do something to help it be understood better. So, but yes, they were not using the opium in India because the British were controlling that. And your next comment was what? Your question? Any apology from any of these countries? I'm not aware of any particular apologies that have occurred, you know. Uh, those countries did support China in the war, and I guess that would be considered an apology, because most of the Western powers were on China's side in the war against, you know, of course, both the first war against Japan and then the second war, uh, the Sino-Japanese War, which turned into the Second World War. We were supplying China and encouraging them and providing for them uh, in that time. Yes? Didn't the United States send Marines into Peking uh, during this period? And if so, did we get concessions back? Uh, the Americans did get concessions. I mean, the Americans were part of this eight-country uh, eight alliance. And so, yes, we did have military there, and we did get concessions. In fact, the British were pushing for concessions, and in almost every case, the very next year after that, France and the U.S. would come in and get the same concessions, like extraterritoriality and the opening of more ports and all of that. And at that point, because the Chinese had already been defeated by the British, they didn't feel like they really had any power to say no. And so France and the U.S. tended, in about a year later, on every one of these treaties, to follow up and get the same concessions. So, yes? I think the, uh, I think the concessions to the Americans uh, was used to give scholarships to Chinese students to go to the United States. Okay. I, I was aware of that, that they, the, um, whatever reparations were used, w w uh, the Americans used that to send Chinese students to the United States for education. I'm not aware of that, but okay. Um, anyone else? Thank you all very much.